So uh, in class here, before break, um, I started to cover what are called compartment models. And these are very flexible models for generating a system of differential equations. Uh, for anything where there are uh, chunks, whether they're organs, pieces of ground, parts of an ecosystem, or what have you, where there's stuff being transferred between them. And that stuff can be energy, it can be a radioactive isotope, uh, it could be a, a pharmaceutical, uh, or in this case, what's being the, the, the three compartments are bare ground, grassy ground, and shrub ground. And the idea is you have some initial condition. Maybe you have 50 acres of bare ground, zero acres of grass, zero acres of shrubs. This is the initial setup. And this is going to evolve somehow. And um, bare ground, we have some numbers here. Bare ground gives way to grass. Uh, the grass colonizes 5%. I forgot my units here. Per year, these are all per year. So 5% of that bare ground becomes grassy ground uh, after a year. Um, and 30% uh, of any existing grassy ground dies off. 20% of any grassy ground is colonized by shrubs. And those shrubs... Uh, lose 15% of their holdings every year. So the thing being passed around here is area. Now the way we make our differential equations is kind of similar to what we did with our mixing problems. Look at the bare ground. So what's changing the amount of bare ground? B dot is the change in bare ground per time. Well, we're losing bare ground. So whatever bare ground we have, we lose 5% of it per year but we gain 30% of grassy ground and we also uh, gain 15% of shrub, shrub ground. And I should say here, I didn't uh, start off, but these functions um, are the, the area held by bare ground grassy ground, and shrub. So what about grassy ground? Well, what happens? Uh, we get some from bare ground. We obtain 5% of any bare ground per year becomes grass. But we're losing 30% of whatever we have. And we're also losing 20%, we're losing 30% to become bare, and 20% is colonized to become shrubs. Now, notice that I'm not using S here. It's 20% of G, right? G is telling me how much uh, area is colonized by grass at any given time. B is telling me how much bare ground there is at any time. S is telling me how much uh, area is covered by shrubs at any given time. And we don't get anything from shrubs. The, uh, Grassy area doesn't increase if there's more shrubs, and it doesn't decrease if there's more shrubs. How do shrubs change? Well, they don't gain anything from bare ground, right? There are no arrows going from bare ground to shrubs. So this is 0B. There's no input from bare ground. Is there an input from grasses? Yes. We obtain 20% of any grassy ground. And then there's an arrow from shrubs to bare. So we're losing 15% um, of shrubs. Now this is our first step here. We will combine these two terms. They're like terms. And then we'll turn this into a matrix equation. So now we have a system of three unknown functions. We don't know what these functions are. But we, <coughs> we have some idea of how they're going to change. And obviously, this is a simplified model. This, this allows you to now start testing predictions. These are coefficients you could obtain through experiments or observation. And then this model, you could test against observations as well. Now, notice that this matrix is going to be full of fairly obnoxious numbers. These are not the sorts of things that you'd want to do by hand anyway. Whoops, a mistake here. This is negative 0 0.05. This is 0. This is 0 0.2. 
And uh, there we have that. So this is the matrix of coefficients. And once again, this matrix is crucial. All of the dynamics depend on those values. Everything about our system, the reproductive rate, the colonization rate, the death rates, is all bound up in this box of numbers. So we need to know the eigenvalues and the eigenvalue, uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this. So you, you know, use a computer, and uh, let's write those down. So I've done this ahead of time. And as I'm writing these things down, I want you to think about what do these eigenvalues mean for the long-term behavior of the system? Now during class, folks were quick to say, those that are all negative, oops, I'm sorry. <coughs> They're all negative. So this would suggest that our, our solution would go to zero as time wears on, as t goes to infinity. Remember that the solution to a system of differential equations looks like this, a constant times an exponential with an eigenvalue times a corresponding eigenvector, another constant, another exponential, another eigenvector, another constant, another exponential, another eigenvector. Right? So if every one of these lambdas is neg negative, then all of these would experience exponential decay. That should worry you. Right? So... You know, what, what's going on? We start with 50 units of area, 50 acres. We can't end up with no area, right? So what's going on? It's right here. Whoops, I forgot a little minus sign. That is different, obviously. So my fault for not including that. So this this is the thing. This number, it, do you think this is a real eigenvalue? Or is this an artifact of the numerical process? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 3, 1, 2, 2. So this is clearly an artifact of the numerical method to find these. So what is this really? This is 0. And so what are the consequences now? Well, now the consequences are that we have a zero in one of our exp exponents, uh, exponential functions. And so it's not even there. So now we have a constant times a vector. So now we can say, oh, well, the limit of our system as t goes to infinity. And again, you know, we take these sorts of limits, which are kind of silly. Nobody's going to wait forever uh, to figure this out. But we usually don't have to. Um, you know, if you look at exponential decay like this. I want to keep pointing this thing out because I uh, don't want this to seem overly abstract, these limits going to infinity. You take um, e to the minus 0.5 you know, times 1, you're at 60% of your original value. And the whole point of exponential decay is it gets fast. Now you're at a third. Three units later, you're at 20%. So if these are years, right, then within three years, we're at a quarter of whatever um, eigenvector we are in this direction. And uh, 4, 13 percent, 5, then less than 10 percent in five years, we're pointing less than 10 percent of this vector is in this direction. <coughs> but what can be difficult with these things is connecting the geometric with the analytic. Our solution is a vector. It has components in three eigen directions, and these directions are fading. Right? They're, uh, and then this is slower decay here, but within five years, you know, this is at ten percent. Um, you know, uh, if we wanted to know what happened in say ten years, this is at uh, a half a percent, and this is probably at a couple percent. And so it doesn't take very long before these are nearly negligible. And most of the solution is in this direction, whatever this thing is. 
So we take limits that go to infinity because it's easy. It's easy to say, oh, goes to zero, as opposed to going to 1%. But the idea is they won't take anywhere near that long before uh, this is describing the long-term solution. So uh, let's uh, look into what that is. So this is going to go towards A3, V3. We just have to find out what this is. <coughs> now to do that, um, what, do we, what do we do? We need our initial condition. Right, so initially the bare ground is 50 units of area. There's no grass. There's no shrubs. When we plug in zero for time, notice how all the exponentials go to one. So what are we left with? We're left with A1, V1, plus A2, V2, plus A3, V3. In a very real way, what we're saying is we need to know initially how to write this vector, which has components of bare space, grassy space, and shrubby space, in terms of these kind of abstract directions, these eigendirections. These directions are, in some sense, the best directions to think about in terms of this matrix. They're the most natural directions. They're not very natural for us humans, however. All the same, let's figure this thing out. Um, so I had sent out a, a note recently on how to do this. And I don't want to write everything over and over and over again. But here's the idea. You have these three vectors. And there's numbers, right? Number, 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 number. And you can rewrite these three vectors as a 3 by 3 matrix times A1, A2, A3. And each of these three columns will be an eigenvector. And uh, here's how you can see that. If you were to check this by multiplying it out, if you were to take this first row times your first and only column, the first component of V1 is times A1. There you are. Your first component of V2 is times A2. There you are. Your first component of V3 is times A3. There you are. And then your second row. Well, your second row, same deal. Uh, second component of V1 times A1. There you are. Second component of V2 times A2. There you are. Third component of V, sorry, second component of V3 times A3. There you are. <coughs> now this matrix, so I'll write it out in case you're uh, following along here, would be 0 0.378, negative 0 0.651, 0 0.986, negative 0 0.815, negative 0 point uh, this, 0 0.0986, 0 0.437, 0 0.752, 0 0.135. This is the matrix times A1, A2, and A3. That equals the initial condition. And I think probably here I'll stop this video and do a part two. Um, think about how you would solve this problem.